out of the dark. I am the first Eve, dark, born on the darkest continent from the richest soil, dark, born on the first evening of the first day of sunlight, dark. I am Homo sapien, sapien. I am 200,000 years of age on this mother earth. I'm the mother of all things human, dark. I'm made from every mineral in the universe, dark. I am Nefertiti, dark. I am Maya Angelou, dark. I am the Cleo in Patra, dark. I am the Gladys of Night, dark. I am the O in Oprah, dark. I am the Egyptian song by Rufus and Shaka, dark. I am every woman painted on the temples of Egypt, dark. I am every mother that has loved and lost a child to evil, I am the holder of the lamp of light in the dark, and I am the guide to freedom through my underground. I am the strength at birth. I possess the miracle milk that feeds the gods. My strength is knowing that my love is the healing for myself and you, woman, deep, dark, and divine. How do you feel when somebody says, oh, she's a pretty black girl? What do you think? Do you like that word? No. Okay. Why? Because I don't like to be called black. Okay, okay. Well, why? Tell me why. Um, because I'm not black. From 1619 to 1865, we were essentially chattel in this country, in the United States. We were nothing more than animals or beasts. That's 246 years. Imagine that. Okay, so here, visual. 246 years in the condition of enslavement where, forget beauty, we weren't even human beings. Then we got emancipation without a plan. We, 1865 to 1964, we were really in a position of post-enslavement, people without real rights. And then hits the civil rights movement, 1965, to the present. Well, if we look at that, this amount of time in, this amount of time out, but of that time out, really only that much time out, because for most of that time from 1619 to 1965, we had no basic rights in this country. Forget beauty. We weren't even considered people in the eyes of the law, nor in the eyes of our, our neighbors in the country and in the world. And so beauty is just a small piece of a much bigger animal. And until we understand that much bigger animal, we'll never understand the issue of colorism. I think that uh, these, you know, conceptions about, you know, color come from within our race. I feel like certain people who may have lighter skin try to boost their self-esteem and to boost their, you know, their self-worth up by putting others down because they know that darker skin, I guess, isn't considered beautiful. And so they can, that kind of puts them up on that pedestal, like saying, hey, I'm, I'm more beautiful than you because my skin is fair. You know what's weird? I get a lot of compliments about my complexion from white people. They love my skin, and it's, it's sad to say, but as a younger person coming up, white people really made me appreciate my skin color. Black people made me question it. I think the problems within the black community has to do more with our lack of unity than about actual racism. We don't really see each other as being part of the community partly because we don't have a language. We don't have something tangible aside from our skin color, which as you can see, like, you know, with um, mixed children, sometimes that's not even present. I see a lot of times within the black community, and I, when I say black, I mean anybody of color, African-American, African immigrants, um, Caribbean American, you have color, to me, you're black. And in a black community, it's like, no, I'm not black, I'm Caribbean, or I'm not black, I'm Haitian. You know, to put in very crass terms, if the Ku Klux Klan is running through here, they're not going to be like, oh, don't hang hard because she's Haitian. No, you're black. We're all together. 
I think skin color amongst the black community is a huge issue in our time. And you still hear a lot of commentary, you still hear preferences. And now with like the age of like the internet and blogs, now you really get to see what people are really thinking because they can hide behind computers and people can make their comments. And it's really shocking and disgusting at the same time to see a lot of the comments that are made by black people about other black people. Just recently, one of my cousins, one of my younger cousins, he's a senior in high school, uh, posted on Facebook on his status, I love white girls, just period, and nobody can do anything about it. And I commented on his status and said, you know, that's fine, just make sure you don't discriminate. And then one of his friends posted, it's not, you know, their fault that white skin just looks better on females. It wasn't so much like I felt like it was an insult to me exactly. I mean, I just felt like it was sad that my someone who I knew, a young guy who was part of my family and his friends, and then other people in my family as well, feel that way, like really feel that way. And it was just really upset me. Raising my daughter, it is very different from raising my sons. Um, especially since um, I'm not going to know, or I don't really know, her uh, battle. Um, and the reason that I know that she has a battle now is because it has become evident. She does not like to be called black. She doesn't even collate like that. She's, um, we're just lighter brown than she is. To be honest with you, I just never, um, I never thought about it until I had her. Because I can see it. I can see the difference. I can see when she is um, at a party or we're at a center or we're at, or she's exposed to the playground or she takes dance class. I can see the difference. I can see how they, um, they treat her differently. Um, she may not feel it, um, she may not understand it, but I know, I know it's there. The impact that it has on those very, very young children spiritually is that they actually start to devalue themselves in such a way where the spirit begins to shrink. The things I used to do because I hated my color was, I used to wish that I can wake up one day lighter or wash my face and think that it will change or get lighter. I thought it was dirt and I tried to clean it off, but it wouldn't come off. I took my color after my father and I used to hate him because of it. I think I remember most saying that, you know, if I, if I had a little girl, I just, I didn't want her to be dark. I didn't want her to be dark like me. I remember being called um, Tar Baby, Monkey, Gorilla, Magilla Gorilla for sale. Your skin is dirty. He comes Blackie. Uh, he comes Tar Baby. I was probably in about second grade, and there was a boy, and he used to tease me all the time, just relentlessly, for no reason. And my teacher, Mr. Lutchman, I asked him, why are you always bothering Hallie? He said, I don't like Hallie because she's too black and ugly. I can remember being in the bathtub asking my mom to put bleach in the water so that my skin would be lighter and so that I could escape the feelings that I had about not being as beautiful, as acceptable, as lovable. I just remember just like looking down at myself and I didn't think I was different, but obviously I was if so many other people were saying that. And I just thought, okay, then I guess I am black and I guess I'm ugly. <laughs> and yeah, it still has a little twinge of hurt when I remember it. <laughs> Being in school, there was just such a separation um, among girls who were lighter skin and girls who were darker skin. We, we were the girls who would catch them in the bathroom and fight them for no reason. You know, just because she happened to be born light skin, 
with pretty hair or pretty eyes. I guess I guess you would say that would be jealousy. And um, it was really bad because in junior high school, you know, the neat, the nair. For Halloween, some people I knew wasn't me. The balls of it in their hair just to take it out. So we were separated and it caused a lot of friction amongst children, which now as an adult just seems stupid to me. You know, our families aren't perfect. Our friends are not perfect. At some point we have to acknowledge they are who they are. And they bring some good and they bring some challenges. And so how do you discern when they're bringing good and embrace that? And then realize when they're bringing some stuff that's really not so healthy. And say, you know what, I'm good. You can keep that, <laughs> okay? You can keep that. My mother and her friend, we were driving somewhere. She's talking to her friend and she's bragging on me. She said, my daughter is beautiful. She's got great eyelashes. She's got the cheekbones. She's got great lips. And then she's going on and she adds, if she, could you imagine if she had any lightness in her skin at all? She'd be gorgeous. And just that last little part, just all that pride that I had about her, you know, having her brag on me, just dissipated. Just dissipated. And I think that that moment is when I really became aware. It's unfortunate that in 2019 we have to go through this, but it's here. Generationally, we still have a lot of stigma about what it is to live in America as a light-skinned person or a dark-skinned person. And unfortunately, these narratives trickle down into our children that we're having. We're still having it because it's still a reality, because white supremacy is still a very real thing um, in the lives of so many people of color. And it, it won't go away until we deal with racism, until we deal with white supremacy and, and what it's left us with. If we start pointing it out, it seems like we're going against the very values or the very foundation of the society that we're in, when that's not the case at all. If you want something to be fixed, you need to be aware that it needs fixing. Straight out of Compton producers in hot water this week over a casting call some are calling racist and colorist. The call categorizes women by letter grade, with those in the A and B category being light-skinned with long hair. The lowest category, D girls, calls for medium to dark skin toned women. It's really low key like a mental illness. So I'm like, oh man, if somebody thinks I'm ugly because I'm dark skin, that, that really sucks for them because I'm great. I am a joy to be around. Honestly, like some folks, we don't have to wait on some folks to die. Like honestly, because a lot of people are really stubborn and they are like really stuck in their ways. And it's like, People being responsible for healing themselves, they don't understand that that's what a responsibility is. I was hoping that was not going to be an issue. I was hoping that we had e evolved enough in our race, in our, in my my age group, and this this generation X and us, and and the generation behind us, evolved enough that that would not even be an issue for them. I spent the majority of my childhood years, my teenage years, and my early adult years trying to hide who I was because just like everybody else, I wanted to be liked. It was not that hard to see that people do not like the loud mouth, truth telling, dark skinned black girl. Lighter hued people get a pass. People love to see them being unapologetically black. People love to see them speak against racism. They live for it. They repost it. They talk about it. It brings pure joy to their hearts. But when people my color do it, oh, of course, we're angry. We're bitter. Um, we just upset because we can't have A, B, and C. We are not allowed to live in our truths, and we are not to, we're not allowed to voice the things that we go through. Until we, as a society, begin to face the fact that colorism is a real issue. It's a large issue. It's an issue that needs to be, again, confronted, put out in the public and before the public, discussed, and let's work towards solutions. I think that um, we'll always be talking about it, just talking. This is a legacy of slavery. You're talking about 
a system that went on for hundreds of years. You don't get out of that just because there was, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, the Civil Rights Movement or whatever. The culture that made whiteness and anything close to whiteness better or seen to be better is still there. And as long as it exists between white and black people, it's likely to exist among black people. You know what, I always wanted to be lighter when I was younger because I felt like that would make life a little bit easier for me. I came through a time where light skin was the right skin. So when I was young and I was in school, you know, the light skin girls got all the play and the dark skin girls got called African booty scratches and just any old weird stuff that they could come up with to call you. And it was just, it was one of the most trying times of my life. And I don't think I realized how, um, how impactful it was until later. When I was younger, I thought that I would start to look like my mom. I thought that I would magically, I don't know where I came up with this thing, but I thought that, um, that I was gonna start to turn lighter the older that I got. And I didn't see that as a negative, and now I, I see what it was. I really wasn't accepting myself. I remember one time my mom sent me to town. I was like probably 10, 11. I was walking down the street and this lady said, Miss, I want to get so black. You black, no. I won't say what. And I remember I just ran, just ran. I didn't stop until I got to the supermarket. Because, you know, I mean, why would you stop a child and tell a child? You know, she was so mean. Like, you're so black. Like, I'm supposed to be, you know, be sorry that I'm black. You get everything, every adjective they could use to describe you, black is always the first one. And as a young girl that, I'm gonna say nine, 10 years old, that how do you, how do you deal with somebody just picking on you all the time because of your color, because you're black? One little boy in particular, always call me that black girl. That go that little black girl. Here come Blackie. Blackie in charge of the class again. As I look back as an adult, I saw so much self-hate in these, cause it was like the black kids, like kids my color saying that to me. Some days I'll like go back and like think like, well, I wonder where this kid is or this kid. And their life manifested into like a self-hate. I mean, they just kind of went nowhere really. But it's really sad because they were failed as children. Children are cruel. And it seemed that every feature I had was unbecoming to uh, my peers. I was always tall. I was always slim. I was always dark. I was black stick. I was um, tar baby. I was all sorts of things that, that were very hurtful. But if I can think back as a child and still tear up at this age, even though I feel that I've overcome that stage in my life, there must be something still in there. I think I go back to being that little girl, remembering that time, that emotion, being embarrassed because, you know, people were laughing and pointing and remember when he said this about her and, you know, watching me break down, you know, watching me run off into a bathroom. I never really liked the spotlight on me, so people pointing, Apparently, I have residue. And being a girl, being a sensitive girl, young lady, trying to do all that's right and still not being Accepted. Not being popular. I didn't want that kind of popularity, but I didn't want to be teased.
And most of it was um, comments about my skin color. Now that I relive it, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Um, I grew up watching a lot of Disney. I loved Cinderella, Snow White, all the you know, beautiful uh, Disney princesses. And I was on YouTube and there was a video of a black girl who was showing people how to lighten their skin. And as I thought about it, I was like, oh, if I lighten my skin, I could look like Cinderella or be beautiful like Snow White or you know, look like these characters that I love here in Montana and all these girls. And then it just kind of skewed my view of myself as oh, there's a way out, you know, as if this is a bad thing or a negative part of me. And bleaching or lighting your skin would be like a, a miracle so that I could look like the beautiful girls that I guess I compared myself to. Even just like hanging out and doing like normal preteen, teenager stuff, like going to the mall and stuff, I definitely noticed like I as well follow her first or like my lighter friends first. And like, I was like the ugly one out the group. Nobody said that. But it was understood and like even stuff like taking group pictures and things like that, like that. I remember having anxiety about like having to take group pictures like with all my friends and just being like, OK, here we go again. Let me get in this back corner and try to like find my light. Oh, uh, and that was and it would sound like so vain when I'd be like, can we turn this way? So like the light can hit me and they're like, what do you mean? The light is everywhere. And I'm like. It's not. It's not. <laughs> I was always encouraged to embrace my skin color. Um, I always loved the color of my skin. I was in love with my father, and my father was dark. And so, of course, I wanted to be like him. My child is dark, and I raised her the same way, to embrace your skin color. There's nothing wrong with... I would get, when she was a baby, I remember this lady stopping me. She was black, and she said, oh, that's such a pretty baby. I said, oh, thank you. She goes, what's the father? So what, I'm, I'm sorry, what do, you, what, what, what do you mean? Well, is he mixed with something, or? he? Because she's so, I mean, her hair is so curly, and she's so dark, but she's so pretty. She's dark, but she's so pretty. Like, because you're dark, you're not supposed to be pretty. I said, her father, is, where is he from? Is he mixed or something? No, he's from Arkansas. <laughs> he's blacker than me. So what are you talking about, lady? <laughs> There's one thing that I'm pretty sure all dark-skinned girls hate. I hate this. Um, oh, you're pretty for a dark-skinned girl. No. You're pretty for a chocolate girl. Oh, you're so pretty for a dark girl. You're so pretty to be so black. If I'm only pretty for a dark-skinned girl, does that mean I'm not pretty in general? Oh, she's a pretty brown-skinned girl, or she's a pretty mahogany skin. And then I have to go get a color wheel and, like, you know, go to Lowe's and, like, is she talking to me or the girl beside me? Like, what's mahogany? I just, I just didn't know that there were so many shades of being black. That's the worst thing that you can possibly say. Like, don't say that. It's just say you're pretty. Just leave it at that. Guys will like tell me about like, oh, you're pretty for a black girl. And I'm like, <laughs> is that supposed to be a compliment? Like, no, I'm supposed like it's not a compliment, but like, do you think that's a compliment to me though? Like, or you have the dark skinned boys <laughs> who bash their own type of girl. Yeah. 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 I, I know somebody, they were like, he's a dark skinned guy. And he was like, yeah, I won't even date any dark skinned girls because just like she said, they're loud, they're ratchet, they're ghetto. But it's like your mother is dark skinned. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> your aunt is dark skinned. So why are you bashing your own type of people, you know? Light-skinned girls look at us differently. I think sometimes we look at them differently, vice versa, because of how we're um, raised in our experiences. I get a lot of people who do say, like, oh, you're not considered black because your lips are small, and I have red cheeks, and, like, no one really has red cheeks. That's more of, like, a white trait. So I used to, like, search up on YouTube, like, how to make my lips bigger, or, like, I try to, like, like hide my, like, red cheeks, but, like, Nothing really worked, so I'm always like insecure about it in a way because I look at everyone else. 
It is about the complexion, but it definitely is about the features. When we're thinking about features that are phenotypically for, I guess, dark-skinned people, that's typically big nose and big lips. And those are typically features that are looked down upon, especially big lips, but if then you have big lips on a white girl or a non-black person or even a light-skinned black person, then it's okay, then it's fetishized. Yeah, I always felt like people were trying to make sense of me or like make me fit into some box. You know, you don't look like you're black. And even when you say that, like a lot of people think that these other mixes are beautiful because of the other, not the blackness. I think it hurts worse when I see my own people still caught up in the paper bag test. Believe it or not, my most um, experience with colorism was within my own family. My mother was Creole. She expected me to be lighter complected. She told me when my grandmother first saw me, my grandmother on her side first saw me, she asked her, Cora, where did you get that black baby? So this started my inferiority complex. I've never shared this with my daughter, but I felt as if I did a disservice to my children by perhaps not marrying someone lighter skinned. I have not shared, and I hope this does not embarrass her, but I have, it is like something that I um, just felt a pain within me. And then it just started to change because she blossomed into a beautiful, beautiful woman, and she's very successful. And this thing just started to just open up. I guess it was just time. It just took time for me to grow. I didn't realize how serious colorism was until I watched my daughter struggle. Born dark like her father. She was a beautiful little girl, bubbly, happy, but she always questioned why her other brother looked like me and she didn't. She felt that she didn't have that same beauty. Felt that she didn't have that, that same worth. Most teenage girls rebel around 13. My daughter was an angel. Now at 17, you almost out the house and now you want to rebel? After I discovered the pills, I put my daughter in like a soft rehabilitation program at a children's hospital in downtown LA. And there is where I learned of my daughter suffering from chronic depression. That's when I learned of my daughter uh, attempting suicide. She was being bullied at school and tortured and called ugly black monkeys. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle it because at the end of the day, I didn't know how it felt to be treated different because of the shade of your skin. Now, my daughter's been clean for over a year. I'm happy that she's happy. I've accepted the fact that now her happiness is as an openly gay female. She came to California and nobody accepted her except for the LGBTQ community at her school. I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for them for giving her confidence and for accepting her and for giving her a, a table to eat at at the lunchroom and for being her friends and for letting her know that she was special. But how would my daughter be if she was light-skinned? When you think about studies that show that women of lighter skin tones get complimented more in general in a range of things than women of or young girls of darker skin tones. So if you're talking about even just in the school setting, 
You have two young girls who both do a great job. They both get A's on something, let's say. And the young woman who is of a lighter skin tone gets complimented and commended more. That's where your self-esteem comes from. That's, how, that's what you start to believe. And how often are you reinforcing things and, and, uh, that you may not even realize you're reinforcing? I, I remember in, I would say, ninth grade, I, I thought, like, what if I just wasn't here? It'd just be easier. But, but, like, the only thing that got me through that was, like, my mom telling me and my friends, especially Kamaya, just, like, being there and, um, someone to talk to it just made me think like I can't leave them because it keeps me like coming to school every day and like just like the smile on my face sometimes it's painful. it is because this shouldn't happen to anyone we shouldn't have to hate ourselves because of the color of our skin and the fact that I had to talk one of my best friends out of not wanting to be like that because of the color of her skin, about the fact that we're just so bad. It's not right. You have to love yourself and love the others around you and know that you're gonna be okay. And you have to stay strong. So, how did you guys meet? At the club. At a club, nightclub. <laughs> yeah, I thought, because this is when I recently moved here, yeah. I've probably been here two years, and I thought he was a student at TSU, Tennessee State, because I'm a professor there, and I was thinking, if he's a student, I need to just move, because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to blur any lines. And he was doing this little dance, and I was like, are you a kappa? And he was like, what, you said, hell no. Hell no, nah, no kappa. <laughs> But you fine as hell, though. <laughs> and I hadn't been able to get rid of him since then. I'm like, dang, she fine. I'm mm -hmm. like, all like, like white on rice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. I grew up in, I grew up in South Carolina, a rural area in South Carolina, mm -hmm. and the thing about that area, though, most people looked like me there, and so my best friend, she's she's light skinned and we had. I think when I was in the sixth grade, this biracial family moved to town, and it was like going to the zoo because they'd walk by and we'd all watch them. Because it, it was—I'm serious—it was—it was something. They were—they were unique, and so we—I had. It was obvious. It was well known. My mother, you know, she ran for mayor. She called the county council lily white bigots and those kinds of things. And so I was aware of that color line. But because Wilhelmina P. Johnson was so proud, and you hold your head up high. You know, it was where it was, it was, it was good to be dark. It was good to be dark, but I was still aware of being dark. And, you know, with the fuller lips, kids would pick on me about my fuller lips. And so even to this day, I don't really wear lipstick because now, you know, I'm like, these lips are gorgeous. Aren't they gorgeous? Man, what you say? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And and so it's 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 those kinds of 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 things. And I remember I used to have you know, dreams of, of just jumping into a vat of ambient, coming out lighter and, and you know, yeah, I really, I really did. So it was, it was, I was aware of it. I was conscious of it. Um, you know, it became, my line name was Dark and Lovely. And, you know, I would always, you know, to marry this, cause I like, I like them dark. I used to be like the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice, all of those kinds of things, because it was where I was embracing it in a way that, you know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm fine and I'm going to find me an, a fine black, black man. But the unspoken other side of it, and even kind of related to Autumn, was like, okay, now, hey, I want to have his baby because my baby may not be as, as dark as me. Even as I grew up into a young woman, I'd never found myself um, attractive because... Um, I would think about, oh, my complexion is, is too dark and I'm not appreciated. And it's something that we would hear as women of color all the time. Oh, you're too dark. 
or you're pretty for a black girl or, you know, that sort of thing. Now, um, through everything I've been through, I've really grown to appreciate us women of color. As a matter of fact, I think we're magnificent. I think there is something about us that just evokes elegance and royalty and there is something about the way we move and the way we smile and there's something about the way we reach out and touch other people and um, there is just a, a genuineness to us in our different shapes and forms and personalities that I find uh, is so celebratory. I think that what we need to do more as parents is instill in our girls a sense of their own beauty and identity. I was very fortunate, and I didn't know how fortunate I was until I, you know, I grew old enough to start mixing with different people. But I was extremely, extremely fortunate. I grew up in a family. Um, there were five girls in the house. I had three brothers. There were five girls, and uh, my parents, my older siblings, always told me that I was pretty. They told me I was pretty. They told me I was bright. They had expectations of me. I tell people up to now, my family believes that I can walk on water. And it, it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. If you can instill that level of confidence in your children, no matter how they look, get them to believe in themselves, what they hear out there is less likely to affect them negatively. And so I thank God for the way that I was brought up. My skin means to me that it is amazing that it is radical charming that it's different unique um that it's mine and um i have a amazing relationship with my hair with my skin with my features with my purpose i am extremely happy that I have this opportunity to be in the skin and to share some truth with my people about our history, about our present, and about just, you know, our future. You know, being a black woman, yesterday, today, and tomorrow is gonna always be dynamic. I didn't think I was pretty because my skin was so chocolate. And it didn't dawn on me until college years when guys approached me because of being dark skinned that I realized that dark skin could be pretty. Isn't that crazy? Like you're 18 years old, you spent this much of your life not realizing that dark skin could be pretty. That's a shame. I did not know that my skin color was an issue. It was not made an issue in my family. And my mother's favorite sister, my Aunt Mary, who was my favorite aunt, um, was very, very fair. And I guess they were just very protective of me. My mother always encouraged me to not only be whoever I wanted to be, but be the best of whatever I wanted to do. I know I was their different child. Um, I'm their left-handed child. I'm their creative child, but I got the support of whatever it was that was needed to feed that, whether or not they understood it. And as far as skin color, um, my dad always said to me, the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. And I believed him. He was my dad, he was my big, strong dad. So why wouldn't, why wouldn't I believe that? Something that I have my daughter say every morning is either a Bible verse or either some kind of um, motivational phrase. And one of the ones that we love to do is our deepest fear, right? Mm -hmm. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And I tell her that every morning, if you just say those two things, you are powerful beyond measure. You know, That's you right. are powerful beyond measure. And every day um, as an assistant principal here at this school, not just the black and brown girls, all of these girls, I try to empower them on a daily basis. Say one encouraging word, even if it's just good morning, but I try to go above and beyond that because our girls need it. Our girls really need that. It has to be a global conversation. Again, we're not topsy. The things we're experiencing as African-Americans are part of a global experience. And when you begin to deconstruct that and put it in, uh, in, in an historical context, 
There are things that begin to make sense, and it can be earth-shaking for people. And I've had that conversation with women from India. I've had them talk to me about the challenges of getting husbands. It is not just our experience. This is a global phenomenon. Coming here, it was kind of strange when people that look like me call me a white woman. Oh, yes. They said that I was white. Um, and it took a while to kind of come to that level of understanding of why they would use that. One, it's being called Obruni. And Obruni means white person or foreigner. And yes, I was a foreigner because I wasn't born in this country, but it didn't make me less of an African. So it took a little while to get accustomed to that. Obruni also means he or she who has come from beyond the horizon. And I came from behind the horizon. And who they saw during that period of our enslavement were white people coming from beyond the horizon. When I was younger, I was a little lighter than I am. So in Ghana, people said I was fair. That's what they call you when you have, a, I guess, a lighter complexion. And, and then they used to call me Obruni, which is the term used for people from our side. And I really resisted it because I felt it othered me. It didn't make me Ghanaian enough. So I actually wanted to be darker. When I went to the States to do my graduate program, I once had my course mate, African-American, refer to me. She was saying, oh, I have this friend. She's as dark as you. And that was the first time I'd been called dark. And it, I thought, oh, this is so interesting because back at home, I'm supposed to be light and here in the States, I'm dark. And I, that was the first time I really paid attention to the different way that color is talked about there. You probably asked a Ghanaian woman and she wouldn't be sure that it's even affecting her in any way. But from just being told that, wow, you're looking nice today. Are you fairer? <laughs> <laughs> and most people also try to tell me that uh, I'm beautiful, I'm fair, and I'm like, no, I'm kind of brown, I'm chocolate, I'm, I'm dark. You know, I'm fine being dark, and it affects us in very subtle ways that we don't, we don't see, and then we in turn teach our children that. Growing up, I realized that all our adverts have people who are lighter as opposed to people who are darker. And this, this will be over 10 years ago, but there was something on TV. The person said, Oba koko, onene dampemna yedum kenia kra uhuno. It means a lighter skinned person, if you are in bed with her and the lights are off, you'll still be able to see her. And I think this became a very popular thing that people were talking about. So everybody wants Oba Koko Efe or a light-skinned woman because then you don't have to go to so much trouble to see her in the dark, right? And I, this is where my personal consciousness about how desirable being light-skinned is for people. One of the things I have always been happy about is that growing up in the Caribbean, growing up in Antigua and Barbuda, I didn't have the burden of racism. When you, when I lived in the States, you know, there's a, it's, it's, it, it adds another dimension because you're not only female with all, that, all the baggage that comes with that or can come with it, but you're also black. Here at home, black has been the majority um, but of late, I've started to wonder if we have not gone into a kind of reversal because um, I see women who are as competent as I am, who are well-educated, who are exposed, experienced, and I see them voluntarily becoming second and third class citizens. When I was really disappointed, is I actually heard people say that when I was appointed as Director General of Tourism for Antigua and Barbuda, they had a problem that I was too young and I was not light enough. But I had to plow through that and not allow it to interfere with my mission and what I was going to accomplish. Personally, I don't even believe that God is a man to begin with, right? So God is not a man. 
I strongly believe that God is a woman because of how merciful he is. It's only women who are able to exhibit the, the certain characters that God exhibits. I also even don't believe that the devil is also male because the way the devil is able to do certain things, I don't think men have the capacity, but that's a conversation for another time. So that is that. I know people who have a child and they're already lightening the child's skin with these chemicals that are not good for your baby. You don't, you don't know what's in there. It's not even good for a grown-up at all. And you're, you're bleaching your child from the beginning. Here in Ghana, there is a lot of skin bleaching because sisters don't perceive themselves as being black and beautiful. There was this issue we had with Nivea, I think, um, in Africa where they were selling, and this I had a problem with on my show specifically, where they were selling what seemed like, you know, a, a lightning cream. And that's something they wouldn't sell in, in Europe, for instance, you know, but it's in Africa. My aunt lives in Italy and she says the Nivea, they, sell, they, they don't sell what they market to us in Africa, but because they know how big um, colorism is here because they know how we women want to be lighter skinned. They, they they sell it here. You know, growing up watching TV, you didn't see girls that you didn't see like you do now. You didn't see girls that look like me, uh, the heavy side and a dark skinned woman. If you did see them, they wasn't doing. They wasn't the lead role. They wasn't the love interest. They wasn't. They were none of that, you know? So I don't know, I just felt that being my skin color or darker was just ugly. For me, I had the Cosby show. So I saw a beautiful Felicia Rashad. I had a good time. So I saw a beautiful, uh, in her character, Florida Evans, and this beautiful African-American man love what is probably um, a very unique character in, in Florida Evans because she wasn't, she wouldn't make it on TV now. In my opinion, I don't think you would see Esther Roll getting a part, a leading part like that. But you saw this, doesn't matter what you look like, you're just beautiful. So I was like, go Florida, you know, go Claire Huxtable. You even saw that going into even the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. But then that was, their sh that, was that shift between the black Vivian and the white, or the light-skinned Vivian. And so everyone was like, what happened to the Vivian? <laughs> what happened to the new Vivian? When I think about positive representations of Black people in the media, it may be cliche, but Black Panther. For me, being 21 years old, that was the first time that I really saw dark-skinned people at the forefront in these positive, powerful, beautiful roles, right? Even though it's fantasy, it's... It was, for me, it, being in the movie theater, one of the first Marvel films I had even really seen, was just really life-changing for me because like it was an all black, primarily dark skinned cast. And like I watched this one video of this kid who wanted to be like 100% black because he wanted to be part of like Wakanda and things like that. I can't imagine if I was like five, six, seven years old, seeing Black Panther, seeing these positive representations, maybe I wouldn't feel the way that I do about myself. I was watching the movie and I was like, wow, wow. There are female warriors. There are African female warriors. And it was, it was overwhelming. For someone who is so interested in the issues concerning women and women being relegated to the background, it was beautiful for me to watch and see that these women are leading, like women are doing something great. And it's just a depiction of how women of color, how women in general, but then specifically women of color are trying to rise from the bottoms and, and come up to. That's spectacular. It's, it's, something, it's something every woman should be proud of. Yeah, I can say that. It's something every woman should be proud of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Representation was definitely mine, seeing dark-skinned women like myself on TV, in the music industry, mm -hmm. um, on social media, just being glorified was a huge help. And that's something that I um, definitely like sought after in order to, to heal. I think the visual thing is really important. And I know that sometimes people don't like social media, but I think that social media is a great way to um, physically put something in front of you that can be a constant encouragement. On my Instagram, I follow things that encourage me 
and I follow visually people that look like me or people that are in places that I want to be and they are they're black people and I think it's important to put that in front of your face uh, because it's an encouragement but I we didn't have that you know even you know 10 years ago so now I feel like a younger generation can now look and know and and celebrate those things on a regular basis in a way that I couldn't when I was first starting. I feel like, I kind of feel like social media is a plus now because on my social media page, it's all these pages of like people just praising black women in all shades and um, all different hair textures from 4C to 4A. Um, and it's, to me, I like social media and I like going on there, see what black people are doing that are good because it's like a commu- we created a community for ourselves, and it's not as negative, I guess you can say, as it was before, where it was just um, light-skinned women being worshipped and put on a pedestal, and um, I guess being idolized into something that they're not—they don't even want to be, like, because they're not perfect, you know. Recently, I have been encouraged by the generations behind me, particularly uh, African American women, embracing their beauty. I'm seeing it happen, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or whatever. It's a it's a, a movement, and it's not just occurring here. It's occurring in other places, and it's entering. It's like the last shall be first. It's like African-American women are actually taking the lead in reclaiming our beauty. And as cultural leaders, as we are, and we are, that just is, as cultural leaders, it is my prayer that as we take that walk forward as black women collectively, that we bring the sisters with us from the places where they've gotten the tail of this thing, the skin bleaching. For us, been there, done that. Some of the things that we've already done and we're moving away from is coming back around and grabbing them. And hopefully they'll see us as healthy and whole and vital and beautiful. And that becomes a much more inclusive movement where more and more women of darker color, women of color, but particularly women of darker color, can begin to fully embrace who they are and why they are. You know, I remember growing up and being told that dark skinned girls shouldn't wear lipstick, shouldn't wear bright colors, right? Um, which I feel like is the biggest lie we've ever been told. Because if you look across this continent, right, if you look at our, our, our prints, they're all colorful. They're, you know, this is how we dress as African women. Um, and I always say that there's no color that a black woman can't wear. There is no color that we cannot wear and rock it, you know. Um, but we, we've, again, we've been socialized to mute our, our, our sort of African features, you know, not bring too much attention to them. Don't bring attention to your big lips. Don't bring attention to your nose, right? Um, it, it, <laughs> my mother would never say it, but part of why, you know, she takes issue with my nose ring and my bright, you know, bright lipstick, the bright colors that I wear is because it's, it's bringing too much attention to the things that society tells me I shouldn't be proud of. There's a community now that there's a community of dark skinned black women who and we sweep each other up and we hug each other and, you know, we high five. Yeah, girl, that black girl magic is really working on you today, you know, and the support. So I think it's much easier for young, young black women, the older ones. I think they need even more love, support, and encouragement. And we just have to find a way to do that and pull pull those Band-Aids off. And it's okay to bleed and it's okay to cry because that's part of the healing. When you think about uh, people of color and particularly African-Americans going to therapy, that's just not something historically we did. And I think part of it is because we really don't understand what therapy is. Um, even to this day, I have people who come up to me and say, people actually pay you just to talk to you? I mean, and I think that's what people really think. They think, you know, we're just talking. <laughs> so why would I tell a stranger my business? And, and that's especially since that's something we definitely don't do. It's amazing how many people come in my room and cry and then apologize for crying. I'm like, you don't have to apologize in this space. And yet, when I think about it, they probably have gone somewhere somewhere else and cried. And somebody say, oh, stop crying. It'll be okay. And try to shut that down. When they felt, felt that emotion coming up, they found a way to suppress it because it's not okay. Or at least they received the message that it's not okay. 
but then when does it become okay? I think that's the problem in the community, the fact that people aren't willing to take that first step. First, you must say, hey, there's an issue. You must acknowledge there's an issue. And then it's dealing with it. Like personally, right now, I'm in therapy. Personally, every week on Wednesday, I meet with a group of sisters and we work on healing for at least two or three hours. It's necessary. Talk therapy really is a broad term of different types of therapy. We know that African-Americans report psychological distress more than um, our white counterparts. However, we do not seek help in the same way. The studies are something like a quarter of African-Americans versus 40% of white counterparts who will seek therapy. And part of this sort of stigma and this shame in our culture, in our community, going to see a therapist is, or being assessed is a sign of weakness. Specifically for, you know, African-American females, we carry this cape of being the superwoman. So if we are superwomen, then we cannot be weak at the same time. Therefore, that leaves an environment for us to not be vulnerable. So therefore, we continue to sort of hold that pain. It's hard for me to understand how we got to a place as a black people that we turn our nose up or frown upon therapy. And I think we're the people that need it the most. When you're a man and you're a slave and you have to watch a slave owner do what they do to your daughter or your wife or your families are separated and sold to this plantation and that plantation and you beat a person down in their mind because truthfully, you know, we outnumbered them. So if you didn't whoop us in the mind, you weren't gonna whoop us physically. So they learned, if we got you in the mind, we got you. And I don't think that that thing is, we're far removed from that. So it's very important for me to take care of my mental health because there's enough outside forces that are trying to beat me down mentally, that are trying to uh, affect the way that I see myself. And if, if you, why would you take more care of your body than you take care of your mind? It's a journey to move from pain to power. It's not a one-step program, not a 12-step program, but an individualized program. And so what is our purpose in living and on this earth plane? Why are we here? We didn't come here to shop at Michigan Avenue. We didn't come here just to eat the finest food or go to the finest restaurants. We came here for a reason. You're beautiful black women. And so there's still a population who feel that I am not beautiful. It's something that we have to find each one of us inside of us. It has to be inside of you. I would encourage them to meditate, to find the purpose and to sit and know that they are wonderful. And I would encourage them to look in the mirror daily and tell themselves how wonderful they are. We're programmed to see dark is better, light is better. We have got to learn how to go in and say, this is not really my own thinking. This is something that's been pushed on me by society. And that's what hypnosis can do. It, it gives you the control for you to start thinking for yourself when you use it in the proper capacity. When we're driving down the street and you pass your exit because you're zoned out, you are in a state of hypnosis. When we watch television, we go into a hypnotic state. When we eat, sometimes we go into a hypnotic state. It is when the body becomes very relaxed and the mind is still active and receptive. This is why you can take on a new behavior or you can learn a new pattern, you can break a pattern because you're in this relaxed state and you're just receptive. I take it back to the point of origin again. When was the first time you noticed a difference? When was the first time you noticed your dark skin? And we connect the event to the emotion behind that. And we go in and we clear out that emotion and we replace it with more positive suggestions. We, were, we surround it in love and light and beauty. And that is when the healing process starts. For people that are just wanting to educate themselves, for me specifically, I would probably go with like self-help books. I have a friend who wrote a book, uh, Women of Color, Keys to Change. 
Her premise is that we as black women are literally the keys to change for the whole world. That out of all of our oppression and all of our suffering, we still rise as Maya said. We historically and even now and even probably more so in the future, we really have blessed the world. I would encourage our women to embrace their past, acknowledge it so, so that they can heal from it. Once their past is healed, they'll be able to help others heal. Our community will be healed. We can accept love then. We can give love properly. We can receive apologies in the midst of pain. And we can move forward and be better as a collective. We don't take care of each other enough. So it is time for us to kind of find our village and our circle of women who are ready to do it differently and who are ready to stick up for each other. And that's what I think a lot of young girls need in the, in the community today, is they need someone to consistently let them know that you're beautiful. You can't hear it one time, and you can't just hear it when you're down. You have to hear it even when you just wake up in the morning and you're feeling okay and someone says you're an angel, or you're beautiful, you're a queen, you're my princess. Those consistent reminders in my home helped me understand that I was one of the fortunate ones and other girls needed that. Dear black girl, I just wanted to let you know that um, as a black girl and black woman that you are beautiful and even if you don't hear it enough, no matter what shade you are, you're beautiful, you're resilient, you matter. Spreading the word and me reaching out to another dark skinned girl, another light skinned girl and giving them the confidence that they need, it's our responsibility. It's not anybody else's. We can't just say, oh, we'll pass it on to somebody else. But what am I doing? What am I saying to them to build their confidence? Because if I'm not saying anything about it, then it will never change. I think it's real important for black women of all ages to reconnect to their own divine power, to understand that they were not brought here to suffer. They were brought here to give light to the world. Daughters of Eve, 100 plus Black Women of Beauty book, volumes one through four, for Black Women of Beauty and Achievement. Now available from www.icebergbooks.com or search for The Daughters of Eve, 100 plus Black Women of Beauty on Amazon.